Tonight, a defiant former president. I think it's going great. I think it's a rigged deal here. Donald Trump is fingerprinted, arraigned, and charged with multiple indictments, but that has not stopped him from his White House pursuit as he wages his own defense. Plus, what we are witnessing today is the blatant and unapologetic weaponization of the criminal justice system. Donald Trump supporters called for protests in the streets following his indictments, and they were out in force as his own spokesperson came out fighting against what they say is a political attack against the former president. And the seismic shifts Trump's charges are having on the 2024 campaign trail as his own Republican opponents are coming out against him, even as others are promising pardons. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. It is a historic prosecution that Donald Trump is calling a persecution. We begin tonight with this poignant moment in American history, a former president in court today facing criminal charges from the very government he was once elected to lead. Today, Trump entered a plea of not guilty to a sprawling 37-count criminal indictment traveling to the Miami courthouse alone this afternoon. Trump was seen waving out of the car window. The former president was fingerprinted, but no mugshot was taken. Then, for the first time, Trump came face to face with special counsel Jack Smith. Magistrate Judge Jonathan Goodman, who oversaw the hearing, ordered Trump not to discuss the case with any witnesses. Outside of the court, there was a festive atmosphere. Most of the hundreds who showed up were there to support Trump, while others were there in protest. So what comes next as this historic legal showdown plays out in the middle of the 2024 campaign season? Our team is standing by to break it all down tonight. And we begin with our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, in Miami. Donald Trump this morning walking to his motorcade at his Doral Resort. The former president riding alone. A brief wave to supporters and a post on social media. On my way to the courthouse, witch hunt. Outside federal court in Miami, a carnival-like atmosphere. Small groups of supporters and opponents, present but peaceful. Inside, Trump was arrested, fingerprinted electronically, but no mug shot, no handcuffs. He was not ordered to empty his pockets. In the courtroom, the former president found himself just steps away from the man prosecuting him, special counsel Jack Smith, who he has attacked in deeply personal terms. Smith sitting just one row behind Trump, glancing at the former president throughout the hearing, Trump never once looked back. Smith charging Trump with 37 criminal counts, accusing him of illegally keeping sensitive classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago resort, in a storage area, a ballroom, even a bathroom. They allegedly included secrets about United States nuclear programs, potential vulnerabilities of the United States and its allies to military attack, and plans for possible retaliation in response to a foreign attack. Prosecutors argue Trump tried to obstruct the investigation by suggesting his attorney hide or destroy documents, allegedly asking the lawyer, wouldn't it be better if we just told them we don't have anything here? In court today, Trump saying not one word. His shoulders slumped, his arms crossed, his face stern. His lawyer entering his plea, not guilty. Sitting at the same table as the former president, one of his closest aides, Walt Nada, who has also been charged, allegedly conspiring with his boss to obstruct the investigation. Nata at Trump's side over the weekend. He rode in the motorcade today. But at the end of the hearing, the magistrate judge ordered Trump not to discuss the case with any potential witnesses, a group that would certainly include Nata. After about an hour in the courthouse, Trump and Nada leaving together, stopping at a Cuban restaurant in Little Havana. Food for everyone. Food for everyone. Trump sounding upbeat as he headed to the airport. I think it's going great. Okay, I think it's a rigged deal here. And with one final wave, he was off. But we'll be seeing a lot more of him for sure. Rachel Scott joins us now from Miami. Rachel, you were inside that courtroom today. We only have the sketches, but I have to imagine that it was quite a striking scene for you to witness with your own eyes. Mm -hmm. 
It was unprecedented, Lindsay. We have never seen anything like this before. And one thing that was striking, the special counsel, Jack Smith, repeatedly glancing over at former President Donald Trump. Trump never once turned around to look back at him. The former president did not utter a single word, but he did not have to. His arms were crossed. His shoulders were slumped. He had to wait about 15 minutes for the judge to start today's arraignment. And at times, he appeared restless, even fidgeting with his hands. One thing was very clear. Trump was ready to get this all over with and get back to his 2024 campaign, Lindsay. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. And now let's get right to ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky. Aaron, what are the next steps for Trump here? Imagine the judge will set one soon to start to lay out a motion schedule as the lawyers make their arguments. You could imagine former President Trump's legal team is already thinking about motions to dismiss the case or diminish the charges, maybe throw out certain evidence. Uh, we'll also see what the judge decides to do in terms of keeping the case here in downtown Miami or maybe moving it to Fort Pierce, north of here, where she usually is based. So there's all sorts of different machinations, but it's unlikely, Lindsay, we're going to see former President Trump in this courthouse again anytime soon, maybe not until trial, assuming the case gets that far. And Aaron, today Trump was also dealt a second legal blow. What are the details on that? Really stunning because it really underscores, Lindsay, just how many legal entanglements the former president is facing. As he was being arraigned on the indictment here in Miami, a federal judge in New York allowed E. Jean Carroll to amend an existing defamation lawsuit to include more comments that Trump made that were allegedly disparaging to her. These comments came after a jury found Trump liable of sexually assaulting Carol back in the 1990s. He went on CNN, he went online, he made all these remarks. And now her lawsuit is going to include those remarks and seek $10 million in damages. So as he's fighting a criminal case, he also has civil lawsuits to tend to as well, Lindsay. Aaron Katursky, our thanks to you as always. We turn now to ABC senior justice correspondent Pierre Thomas. And Pierre, special counsel Jack Smith didn't have to be in the courtroom today. This was a choice. There he was, seated one row behind Donald Trump. What does that signal? Dramatic move. He clearly wanted to indicate to the president, I'm here. I'm the person who personally brought this case against you, and I stand by it. He also was making a statement to his staff. I support you. It's a long road ahead. You have a case to prosecute. There could be threats involved. But all of this, I support you as well. By all accounts, we've heard that Trump was stoic, obviously didn't utter a word inside that courtroom. Are you getting a sense that he really realizes the the seriousness of, of these charges? Listen, I don't know how he couldn't. He faces decades in prison if convicted. We're talking about 37 counts here. Uh, as his legal threats go, this is the most serious case that he faces, period. These are federal cases, federal felonies, and we have a situation. This case is brought by the best, some of the best investigators at the FBI and by the Department of Justice, the full weight of the Department of Justice. Our senior justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you as always. Good to have you in studio. Pleasure. And now let's head back to Miami, where Victor Akendo is at the iconic Cuban restaurant Versailles. Victor Trump headed straight there right after his arraignment. How big of a political power play was this for him? Lindsay, this is the most well-known Cuban restaurant in Miami. For political candidates, it is a must-stop. This place has been in business for over 50 years. Typically, what you'll see is they'll come by here to this window, La Ventanita, and they'll place an order of Cuban coffee and some pastries, but it's also in the heart of the Cuban exile community. Still a little loud around here, as you can tell. It's a logical stopping point for the former president. He had a lot of supporters here to greet him, and at one point, a group of them even formed a prayer circle around him. Lindsay? And as we hear the, the horns honking there, aside from that, what's the atmosphere there like now, hours after his departure? Yeah, Lindsay, for the most part, I'd say it is back to business as usual here at Versailles, focusing on their dinner rush. But I should mention that as political as campaign season really ramps up here, it's really just a matter of time until another candidate stops by here. Lindsay? And, and just curious, Victor, have you gotten a chance to talk to anybody who was there when Trump was there? And were they excited? How did they describe the atmosphere? Yeah, I can tell you they were definitely excited, which is the same thing that we saw when we were outside of the federal courthouse today. The atmosphere there 
felt more like a rally, which is pretty surprising given the severity of what was happening inside. Here, I can tell you that those who are still here when the pres former president came by, they were just excited to see him, thrilled to have a moment with the former president. Lindsay? Really interesting there. All right, Victor Kendo, our thanks to you. And let's head now to Mary Bruce, watching this all play out all day long from the White House. Mary, the White House didn't make any comments when the arraignment came out. Have they said anything today? No, Lindsay, the president is actually going out of his way not to comment on this repeatedly today, ignoring reporters shouted questions on this. The president is well aware that Trump and his supporters are trying to claim that this is all politically motivated. And Biden, we are told, wants to protect the independence of the Justice Department, fearful that if he weighs in in one way or another, that it could be construed as him somehow trying to influence this and cause some to question the integrity of the investigation, Lindsay. But despite the president staying silent, and his wife, First Lady Dr. Jill Biden, did make some remarks. What did she have to say? Yeah, the First Lady is weighing in. She was speaking behind closed doors at a private fundraiser in New York last night, and she said she thinks it's a little shocking that Republicans don't seem to care about the indictment. She was referencing recent polling that shows that Trump supporters are not wavering here. It is perhaps a sign that the Biden campaign is frustrated about all of this for sure. But the big question now, Lindsay, is just how long can Biden and his campaign stay silent on this, and when will they go on the attack? Lindsay. Mary Bruce from the White House for us. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you. For more on this, let's bring in ABC News contributor and former FBI agent Asha Rangappa, now an assistant dean at Yale's Jackson School of Global Affairs. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, looking at these charges, I, I just want you to give us a sense of how strong of a case the Justice Department has laid out in their 37-count indictment, keeping in mind that former U.S. Attorney General uh, William Barr called it an egregious obstruction. Even if half of it is true, he said he is toast very, very damning. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's a very strong indictment. So on the Espionage, uh, Espionage Act charges, uh, the 31 documents that are each one count uh, for p each document that's in there, you know, that has to be national defense information. That is a part of the violation to willfully retain that and not give it up when an official comes and asks for it. And we see that this is clearly national defense information. It's nuclear secrets. It's our military strategy. So I think that part they definitely had down. On the obstruction and false statements, they have very hard evidence. They have audio tapes. They have text messages. They have photographs that will all come to, you know, going to the intent to conceal and prevent the FBI from getting this. This really gets to the heart of the obstruction because the hardest element to prove there is the intent. And here you have it in words and recordings. And you really touched on, on this, but I'd like you to go a little further, put like a little bit of a sharper point on it. When we look at the types of classified documents at the center of these charges, how significant is it that so many of these documents are related to military matters and even uh, about nuclear weapons? How does that impact the case? It impacts the case not only because it meet, they meet the elements of the crime, it's clearly national defense information, but it's also going to be compelling to a jury. What Jack Smith has done is taken really sensitive documents. These aren't you know confidential documents that people might wonder, hey, why is this classified? A jury will understand why these had to be protected, what risk was there by, you know, putting them out there so cavalierly by not returning them to the government. So there is, I think, a jury appeal uh, to the particular documents. I'll add that there were 13 top secret documents that were recovered in this whole uh, saga that weren't used. And I think it's important to emphasize that they weren't used likely because they couldn't risk disclosing them in the course of a trial in any way, which means that the sensitivity of the items that were at Mar-a-Lago was likely even greater than what we see in the indictment itself. That's really interesting to note there. And let's talk about one specific piece of evidence, and that's the audio recording of the former president talking about some of those classified documents in his possession, where he reportedly says, as president, I could have declassified it. Now I can't, you know, but this is still a secret. Is that a potential smoking gun? It's a smoking gun in terms of undercutting or 
you know, dismissing the kinds of defenses that Trump will want to make and that we've seen him make in the court of public opinion. So one is, for example, that he had nothing to do with the packing of these documents, that he had nothing, he didn't know what was there, that, you know, he's the former president of the United States. There's a lot of people who do this. This shows that he knew he possessed classified information. The second defense we've seen him trot out is that he declassified these before he left, that somehow magically he he did this on his own without telling anyone. Well, this audio recording suggests that he knows that these are still classified, that he had he did not classify them, and that he understands that there was a procedure that needed to be followed in order to declassify it. So this really uh, cabins the kinds of defenses that I think he's going to make, which is why the special counsel included that recording in the indictment. Uh, we know that dozens of former Trump aides, as well as Secret Service agents, have testified before the grand jury. What does that tell us about the scope of information that the special prosecutor has been gathering about the former president's handling of those classified documents? Well, the special counsel is going to have a number of people who are around President Trump every day. The, the Secret Service follows him around. In many ways, you know, he's basically had federal law enforcement officers watching him potentially commit federal crimes that now are duty bound by their role to have to provide this. You know, these aren't people who can uh, litigate and stonewall. This is a part of their job to testify, to uh, report crimes that they see. And so the special counsel is going to have a lot of credible evidence. But I think also the compelling evidence here is just the receipts in terms of the text exchanges and in the lawyer notes from his own from Trump's own lawyers, which documented Trump's attempts to stonewall and try to hide the documents from the FBI and the Department of Justice. All of this together is going to be incredibly damning. Uh, given that so many people are, are paying attention to this timeline because of uh, he's still the top contender on the Republican side of, for the 2024 presidential campaign, give us a sense of what you can expect timing-wise and, and as far as the strategy on both sides as this case moves forward. Yes, I would think of this as the end of one journey and the beginning of another. We're used to watching Law and Order, where we go from investigation to conviction in an hour, and that's just not how it works. The investigation phase has ended, but the trial phase, or the this phase until trial, is going to take a long time. Not only because of the pretrial motions that were mentioned previously by uh, Aaron, but also because this is a national security case. So it's going to involve a statute called the Classified Information Procedure. Procedures Act, SEPA. And this involves a lot of back and forth about how to treat the classified information in terms of disclosing it and turning it over to the defendant. This is a public trial. The defendant is entitled to have the defense, uh, the, the evidence against him. And of course, this gets complicated, this tension between defendants' rights and national security in this type of case. So that itself will take a lot of pretrial motions. And I I suspect that this trial will not start until well into the campaign season. It's not clear to me whether it would even start or be concluded before the election. Wow. All right. Asha Rangappa, our thanks to you for your insight and knowledge on all of this. We appreciate it. Thank you. And now let's bring in former Republican Congresswoman Barbara Comstock. She joins us now for reaction to today's charges. Uh, this day has been predicted for some time now, but now that it's happened, what's your reaction? Well, uh, you know, it, it certainly is something, you know, with Donald Trump, you know, you sort of have defined deviancy down so nothing surprises you. But I do think you're starting to see Republicans, particularly some of those on the campaign trail, certainly uh, Chris Christie, Asa Hutchison, but also, um, you know, you saw Tim Scott separate themselves from defending Trump in, in some ways. And you saw, also saw Senate Republicans say they, they weren't going to defend it and that these were serious uh, charges. So I, and then you also saw people, you know, even those usual defenders, say, on Fox News, uh, Britt Hume, uh, Jonathan Turley, who is one of those uh, legal defenders of Donald Trump, usually, who said, no, we can't uh, defend this. And certainly former Attorney General Bill Barr has been very vociferous in saying this is indefensible and that he thought Donald Trump is toast. So I do think you are seeing Republican voices 
uh, starting to separate themselves from defending Donald Trump, uh, even though you do have many House members defending them, I do think there are more and more moving away. And as more of the details come forward, I think you may see more of that. Well, I, I'm curious to really follow up on that because of two uh, numbers that we have here. When we look at should Trump have been charged, 48 percent, so we're talking about nearly half of those who were polled said yes, right? But then when you look at the question of are those charges politically motivated, again, nearly half of people, so 47 percent. I'm curious, when you talk about Republicans who are uh, moving away from Donald Trump, I mean, for nearly half of the people polled to say that they think that this was politically motivated, I don't know that that jives with the idea that Republicans are moving away. Well, I think these days, all of these things are seen as political. You know, you still have Republicans who think this isn't fair because they want to say, you know, why wasn't Hillary Clinton charged or why it isn't Joe Biden charged? But I do think because of the particular charges here, listen, I worked with Evan Corcoran, the lawyer here that Donald Trump tried to get to lie, basically, about these documents. The lawyer who, you know, as you read this and see that he first he tried to get him to hide the documents and, you know, participate in this fraud with him. And when Evan, who I know to be a good person, said, no, I won't um, participate in this, then he, you know, Donald Trump then participated in this fraud and hid the documents from Evan so that Evan couldn't find them. And then, you know, he was trying to get Evan or other lawyers to certify that the documents, you know, all had been gone through. So I think as you, as people find these kind of facts out, it does become difficult for Republicans to defend that type of behavior, which is very unique. Now, that doesn't mean they don't think that it's partisan, but I do think this particular fact pattern, become, you know, when you delve into it and get that kind of detail, realize that Donald Trump's own lawyer is that are, that's the person who's testifying against him. And when you realize, you know, again and again, the lawyers who worked for Donald Trump, just like in the past, his campaign managers, his own family, people, you know, who, you know, who had to testify against him, you know, on January 6th matters, you realize that, you know, Donald Trump engages in a lot of indefensible behavior. Former Republican Congresswoman Barbara Comstock, we thank you so much for your time. Always appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. And joining us now for more is Republican presidential hopeful and former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson. Governor, thanks so much for your time tonight. Uh, it's good to be with you. Thank you. So you're a former federal prosecutor. Obviously, this is unprecedented case as we continue to describe it that way. Uh, you've now had the opportunity to read the indictment. Do you think that federal prosecutors have a strong case? I do. Uh, whenever you look at the specificity that's laid out in the indictment, it's a very strong case. Obviously, uh, this is going to have to be tried. You've got to prove all of that. But as Bill Barr said, if, if half of that is proved, uh, then it's a very devastating case that's being presented against the former president. I'm very pleased that there's been more Republican leaders step up and say, this is serious. We're not going to dismiss this lightly, particularly when you have service men and women that are held to, a, to the same standard and are held accountable if they violate that. And so this is a, a serious matter, both uh, from the, for the criminal justice system, but also for uh, selecting the future leader of the country. And so I'm delighted that more uh, leaders are showing courage and saying this is serious and we should not dismiss it lightly. Do you have any idea if this case would have the likelihood that it would be decided before the 2024 election or, or before the primary season? Well, I've actually uh, tried cases in which uh, classified information was involved. And it does add a level of complexity because you have to have the clearances, you have to have the protection as you exchange uh, the information as you get ready for trial. And so it is more complex than, than normal. But I hope that uh, the judges and the courts understand that you have to be fair to the defendant and give them uh, the right to prepare. But at the same time, there's extraordinary public interest for our nation in getting this issue resolved in a timely fashion. The Speedy Trial Act 
applies not just to protect the defendant, but it also applies to give the public uh, protection and assurance that justice is not going to be delayed. And so uh, I think that it's going to continue through the campaign season. Uh, you're going to be looking at debates in August. You're going to be looking at primaries next year. And uh, former President Trump is likely to have court appearances during that time. It'll be interesting to see whether the, the court's trying to accommodate his campaign schedule or whether they're going to insist upon compliance with the court schedule in a timely hearing of this case. Uh, what do you think about some of the, the fellow Republicans who are also running for president, uh, who are promising pardons uh, for, for President Trump, former President Trump? Do you feel that that's appropriate? It is wrong. Uh, it is unjustified. It is a bad precedent. Uh, they're politically pandering uh, to get votes using the federal pardon power. So, no, it incenses me as somebody who's had to use the pardon power as governor and respects that power as president, and you don't use it as a campaign uh, wedge issue or a campaign tool. So I'm offended by that as someone who loves our justice system in America, and it's wrong uh, for candidates to be promising that, whether it's to a former president or whether it's to an average Joe that's out there. Uh, you just don't do that during a campaign. I want our candidates to show more courage and to speak out about this and provide leadership. Trump currently, as you well know, remains the front runner for the 2024 nomination on the Republican side. You've called out, uh, called on him to drop out of the race. Uh, that does not appear that that would be likely at all. But would you support him if he is nominated? Well, I'm not going to support somebody who's convicted of a felony, particularly one as involving the secrets of the United States. That's not reflective of who our commander chief should be and our national character and the high regard that we have for our military and those that collect these secrets. And so uh, we'll see how the debate develops uh, and how the case develops. Uh, and I'm not going to be supporting somebody who is convicted or who has uh, wrongfully uh, handled a material that jeopardizes the security of the United States. Governor, is that to say that you would support him if he is not convicted? Well, I don't expect him to be the nominee, and I want to be on the debate stage, so I expect that uh, we're going to be uh, negotiating this language to assure that uh, there's not going to be a circumstance that we're bound to support somebody who is convicted of a very serious felony that uh, violates the uh, high office of president and the handling of classified material. That's very important for our country, and no candidate should take that lightly. So let's see how that develops. Uh, but I want to be on that debate stage, and I hope there's that opportunity. We've also got to have 40,000 donors. And so I hope everybody goes to asa2024.com, helps me to get on that debate stage. Just want to take one more swing at it, Governor. You would consider, if he's not convicted, supporting him? Uh, I want to look at what we have to do, what the language of that is. I haven't seen the language of the pledge yet, so that's still under negotiation. And I hope it's something that I can live with because I want to be on the debate stage, but there's certain principles you don't cross. Uh, there are at least 12 candidates currently in the race. Are you worried that this is 2016 all over again, too many candidates, and that your participation in the race would only allow Trump to, to become the nominee should you drop out? Well, uh, people understand who Donald Trump is. Uh, I think the fact that there's uh, 11 other candidates in the race reflect that uh, there's a lot of leaders that want a different nominee than Donald Trump, and we want to beat Joe Biden, and he's not the right one to do it. So there's almost a unanimity uh, in that message. Uh, as far as the number, that's going to sort out uh, over time. That's what Iowa sorts out. That's what New Hampshire does. As I talk to the voters in New Hampshire most recently, uh, they're telling me this is serious. Uh, they believe that it is uh, political and a double standard here, but they also treat it as very serious and something that uh, they're not taking lightly and will be a factor as they make their decision uh, going into the uh, primary and caucus season. Presidential hopeful and Governor Asa Hutchinson, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. Good to be with you.
Now I'd like to bring in ABC's John Santucci, who's reported on Donald Trump since he first ran uh, for the White House back in 2015. Always good to have you here. Nice to Whenever you. you're here, though, it is not a good day for Donald <laughs> Trump. What are you trying to say, Lindsay? <laughs> <laughs> but, but seeing him leave the courthouse and then go right to that, uh, that restaurant in yeah. Florida, I mean, that seemed like classic playbook for Donald Trump. Well, to a degree, right? I mean, playbook in the sense that, you know, he quickly wants to pivot a moment, but not classic in the sense that those are stops he doesn't typically enjoy. He doesn't like doing the glad handing, he doesn't love going to the diners or restaurants or things like that. Um, I remember the first time that he did it in 2015, he actually looked at the press that followed him and said, what am I supposed to do? I mean, he's not comfortable in those moments. Um, but clearly, though, as we've been reporting, he wants to very quickly pivot away from this, right? Delay this case as much as humanly possible, get back on the campaign trail. And really, the campaign is going to be that this is a case that's being built, though against him, he's going to say they're doing it to come at his supporters. And you obviously have a direct line to the Trump uh, ensemble there. What are you hearing with regard to his response to to today's charges. You know, the word everybody keeps using with me is defiant. Um, they, they say he's calm. Uh, they say actually that trip put him in a good mood. He was buoyed by the fact there were so many people there cheering his name. We know he loves uh, that adulation part of things. Um, but, you know, I think those the imagery that our colleagues Olivia Rubin and Rachel Scott describe from court, you know, we know that's weighing on Donald Trump. You know, Donald Trump's body language is very revealing. Him sitting there, arms crossed, not looking around, the tenseness of it all, it, it plays right into what I've been hearing, which is fits of anger for the last couple of days. These charges weighing on him, reading through that indictment, seeing how many people told the story that ultimately got Donald Trump charged, including Donald Trump. John Santucci, always appreciate your wisdom and insight. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lindsay. And we still have much more to get to here on Prime tonight. Coming up, nearly two dozen troops injured overseas. We'll tell you where. But next, tired of feeling like, remember that old Tupac rap line, trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents? We update you on our nation's inflation. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners. And the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back, everyone. Donald Trump's historic federal arraignment has been front and center today, and we will go back to that in a few moments. But now some other major headlines that we're following across the country. Crews are working around the clock in Philadelphia to clean up that highway collapse caused by a fuel tank truck that exploded on an underpass. And tonight we are seeing new video of the moments of the crash. ABC's Janae Norman has the latest. 
tonight as crews demolish what remains of that fire damaged I-95 overpass. Investigators are reviewing this new video showing the moment the fire ignited as they try to determine what caused that tanker truck hauling gasoline to crash and explode in a fireball under the overpass early Sunday. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg getting a first-hand look at the destruction today, vowing to rebuild fast. The only thing that's even more important than making sure it's restored quickly is making sure it's restored safely. Experts say that inferno likely reached far greater temperatures than the 932 degrees that could cause steel in the overpass to lose a significant amount of its strength. Officials say it could take months to rebuild this overpass. Business owners say the collapse costing them customers. I'm losing a lot of money and government should take action quick and do something because it's not just me. The economic impact likely to be felt far from the collapse site. And Lindsay, Secretary Buttigieg says shipping costs could go up on the East Coast as trucks take longer detours to avoid the collapse. Officials here plan to announce their plans to redo that overpass tomorrow. Lindsay. Janae, thank you. Overseas, 22 U.S. soldiers were injured in a military helicopter accident in Syria. The Pentagon says no enemy fire was reported, but 15 of the injured have been evacuated for higher care. Here's ABC's James Longman. Tonight, the U.S. military says it's investigating a helicopter mishap that's left 22 U.S. service members injured in northeastern Syria. This was an MH-47 Chinook um, that had a problem with one rotor that caused a hard landing. The U.S. military says no enemy fire was reported at the time. The incident Sunday left service members with injuries of various degrees, according to U.S. Central Command. A U.S. official tells ABC News 15 were transferred to a military hospital in Germany. As of right now, uh, all of the service members involved in that crash are in stable condition. This comes after officials ordered a 24-hour stand-down of all aviation units back in April to focus on safety protocols. That order followed three helicopter crashes since February that killed 14 service members. There are roughly 900 U.S. soldiers in Syria right now helping partner forces in the fight against ISIS. Lindsay, the investigation into what caused this crash is ongoing. U.S. troops in Syria and Iraq helped with 38 missions against ISIS in May alone. Lindsay? James, thank you. Data released today shows that U.S. inflation may be leaving the sky-high days behind. Consumer prices rose 4% last month compared to a year ago. That's the slowest annual pace since March of 2021 and slightly better than expected. The fresh data comes a day before the Federal Reserve meets to announce its latest rate decision and bolsters hopes that the Fed may pause its rate hiking campaign. Next tonight to the severe weather for 16 million Americans from Texas to Florida. We've seen damaging winds, massive hail, and an isolated tornado. And tonight there's a heat wave brewing with temperatures over 100 degrees possible in some places. Our chief meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking it all. Hey, Ginger. Hey there. You know, Lindsay, we've already had a reported tornado in Stratford, Texas. We've had tennis ball size hail from Pecan Hill, Texas, which is just south of Dallas, over to Shreveport. So you're going to see more of that big hail tonight. The severe thunderstorm watches also include the Florida panhandle over to Savannah. But you see how that front is stationary. It's got both the warm front symbol and the cold front. Well, that means stationary, meaning it's not going to move much. And the next 24 hours, you're going to have another afternoon and evening of even more enhanced severe storms. So do expect more of that baseball size or bigger hail and some damaging winds, Jackson, Montgomery and Albany, Georgia. That's just going to get a little more oomph from the atmosphere. That's from that jet stream. But below that jet, and it's a very active subtropical jet, you have serious heat and a heat dome that's building into what could be a dangerous weekend and really week of temperatures that are in the heat index up to 114. I mean, that's the thing is if you have one or two days this time of year, okay. But when you're exposed, especially for prolonged times, look at the dates on the bottom there through Saturday in Houston, a heat indice of 110. So it looks like it breaks down early next week, but that's a long time for folks to be enduring that heat there in Texas. Lindsay, really hot temperatures there. Ginger, our thanks to you. So much more to get to coming up. The literary world loses yet another iconic author. But next, we break down former President Trump's second arraignment for you by the numbers.
so much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I came out of jail with a plan. I was going to put every piece of energy I had into music. Give it up for Jelly Roll! Somebody. If I wasn't a musician, I'd be dead. This was my best bet to really have an impact. <laughs> I'll cry with you. Who would have thought I could help people? I needed help, you know? I still need help. Somebody save me. I love you. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. Former President Trump's arraignment today marks a historic moment. Let's take a look at the scope and scale of it by the numbers. Trump is now the first former president to be indicted on federal charges to which he pleaded not guilty today. Trump faces charges of violating seven federal laws and was arraigned on a total of 37 counts related to classified documents that he retained after he left office. That includes 31 charges for the willful retention of national defense information charged for each secret or top secret classified document that is the focus of the investigation. He also faces three separate charges related to withholding or concealing a document and another three charges for conspiracy to obstruct justice, a scheme to conceal and false statements and representations. The unauthorized retention of national defense information falls under part of the Espionage Act, a 1917 federal anti-spying law passed shortly after the U.S. entered World War I. It has most frequently been used in recent years for the prosecution of government employees for leaking 
leaking national security secrets, such as the 2013 charges against Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning was sentenced to 35 years for the leaking of classified information to WikiLeaks, although her sentence was later commuted by former President Obama. As for Trump, the maximum punishment for each count of unlawful retention of documents is 10 years in prison, while some of the obstruction and concealing evidence charges can carry punishments of up to 20 years each, but experts say that federal defendants are rarely given the maximum punishment. And we should note that today's federal indictment comes after Trump was indicted in April on 34 counts in New York related to alleged hush money payments to porn star Stormy Daniels, which was the first time a former president had ever been indicted. And we still have much more to get to tonight on Prime. Officers race against time to help a desperate mother save her daughter. And we tell you about the latest scam that has one state's attorney general sounding the alarm. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. A mother's desperate plea to save her daughter, a Costco recall, and a new album by The Beatles. These stories and more in tonight's rundown. Dramatic body camera video shows Utah police officers rescuing a 12 year old girl who is trapped in a car underwater. She's 12? 
Hey, take your boots off. We're doing this. The video shows Tooele cops arriving where witnesses were screaming for help. The officers are seen taking their boots off before going into the water. Though much of the rescue isn't seen, officers are heard shooting into the car in order to get inside. The gun! Give me the gun! Please, please, she's in the feed! Officers pulled the girl out and performed CPR before she was taken to the hospital. We got her out of the car. We're starting CPR. We're starting CPR. KTVX reports that she was in stable condition. Sentencing has been delayed for rapper Tory Lanez and the shooting of Megan Thee Stallion. The sentencing hearing was originally scheduled for today, but moved to August 7th after Lanez's defense team filed a motion for continuance, which was granted. Lanez was convicted last year on multiple felony charges for shooting and injuring Megan Thee Stallion in July 2020. He faces up to 22 years and eight months in prison. A voluntary recall has been issued on large bags of frozen fruit sold at Costco over hepatitis A concerns. Wawona Frozen Foods issued the recall, which includes packages of the company's organic Daybreak blend distributed between April and June 2022. A notice on the FDA website said those packages contain strawberries grown in Mexico that may have the potential to be contaminated by hepatitis A. The products were sold in Costco stores in five different states. Wawona Frozen Foods said the recall was out of an abundance of caution and that no illnesses had been reported. A police chase for a carjacking suspect ended at a Houston school. Police said officers were pursuing a suspect who carjacked a vehicle and eventually caused a rollover crash when he collided with another vehicle. The suspect then allegedly fled on foot to the Harmony School campus nearby. The school, which was hosting summer classes at the time, went into secure mode. An official said the suspect was detained within 10 minutes with all students and staff safe. Olympic gold medal sprinter Tori Bowie died from childbirth complications, says the autopsy. The Associated Press says the medical examiner's report found Bowie was an estimated eight months pregnant and showing signs of labor at the time of her death and may have had respiratory complications and seizures. Bowie was found dead May 2nd. She was 32. She won gold, silver, and bronze medals at the 2016 Summer Olympic Games. New music from the Beatles is on the horizon. Yes those Beatles. We were able to take John's voice and get it pure through this AI so that then we could mix the record as you would normally do. In an interview with BBC Radio, Paul McCartney said that artificial intelligence allowed him to produce what he calls the final Beatles record, more than five decades after the iconic group originally split. He said the technology was used to extricate the late John Lennon's voice from an old demo. The song is expected to be released later this year. Identity theft is on the rise, and the Attorney General's office in Chicago says they've seen a huge increase in cases, specifically unemployment insurance fraud, one of their fastest growing problems. Here's our Alex Perez. I was surprised and concerned. Ed Dudley says he was in disbelief when he received at least five of these letters stating he had applied for unemployment benefits. I hadn't filed an unemployment claim. When the first one came, I thought perhaps it was just a one-off. But then not too long after that, I received uh, yet another email. Dudley, who lives in the Chicago suburbs, says most of the claims under his name were denied. But he says he did receive an email saying at least one claim was processed to an unknown bank account for more than $800. This type of identity theft is so rampant. Our Chicago station WLS reporter Jason Knowles and the ABC 7i team have heard from hundreds of local people who say they are also victims of unemployment fraud. The Illinois AG's office says the scam varies, but here's one way they say these criminals are preying on the unsuspecting. A scammer gets your personal info through places like the dark web. They then file an unemployment claim using that info and tie the claim to a bank account the scammer can access. Suddenly, you're getting an email or letter in the mail that says you've applied for unemployment insurance, but you never did. These scams are so rampant, even Illinois Attorney General Kwame Raoul was targeted. I was the victim of it myself, where I received a debit card in the mail as a result of somebody filing for unemployment benefits in my name. 
In A.G. Raul's case, he believes the scammers were trying to change the mailing address to get the funds sent to themselves, but failed. In a lot of cases, sometimes it's a small-time actors on a local level, but sometimes it's international actors, so it's difficult to, to crack sometimes. But uh, we've been successful in, 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 in some cases. Ed Dudley says he was never able to figure out how exactly his identity was stolen, but hopes by coming forward he can motivate others to better protect their information and avoid falling victim. Our thanks to Alex Perez. And if this happens to you, to help protect yourself, the Department of Labor says that you should monitor your credit report and sign up for identity theft alerts in case thieves use your information against you in other ways, like opening up credit cards. And the U.S. Postal Inspection Service says to report the fraud. Otherwise, it could impact you if you need to file for unemployment. And we learned today Pulitzer Prize winning author Cormac McCarthy has died. The best selling author known for such titles as All the Pretty Horses, No Country for Old Men, and The Road was widely regarded as one of the greatest writers in American history. Cormac McCarthy was 89. ABC senior national correspondent Terry Moran joins us now. And Terry, we now have a twice indicted former president of the United States. Give us a sense of the historic nature that played out yet again today. Unprecedented, Lindsay. That's the word that kept coming up that everyone was using because it's right. Uh, we've never seen anything like this in American history, but that's in part because we've never seen anything like Donald Trump. Uh, he is the most dominant figure in American politics. He, uh, the whole political discussion revolves around Donald Trump and about what he stands for. We haven't seen anything like him you know, since Reagan or FDR, but unlike them, uh, this is a man with profound character flaws. And don't take my word for it. The people who worked for him in his own administration say that. And the combination of his towering influence in American politics, tens of millions of Republicans, you know, will go uh, lie down in traffic for him. Uh, and these character flaws that, that, end, that land him in so much trouble, this time criminal charges in a federal court. You would never say anything like that. We are in uncharted waters for sure. I want to just look at an ABC News Washington Post poll that found that uh, when people were asked if Trump should suspend his campaign, 46 percent said that he should. So uh, we're talking about nearly half said that they should. Uh, 38 percent said that he should not, which is a significant amount. Uh, 16 percent said that they didn't know. I wanted to pick up on a point that you said earlier today, Terry. You talked about how he's making this personal trial part of his political identity. Uh, just explain what you mean by that. It is. I think those numbers reflect basically the divide in the country with some independents in the middle. But what you're hearing from Donald Trump is that this election is going to be about this case, this prosecution. He wants to tell his supporters and, and beyond that the prosecution of him is the persecution of them, that he is taking uh, the shots, the arrows on their behalf, because the same elite that failed them, is what he will say, is trying to go after him because he's the only one who can rescue the people who feel the country's in the wrong direction. And that's a lot of people. And so his political plan is to make this election about this case. Uh, it'll be difficult because, you know, courts don't operate at the speed or in the way that politicians do. Uh, the country will move on to new issues, new challenges. This case is from yesterday. And I think the challenge for Donald Trump is to make him relevant for 2024, not 2020 or 2016. ABC senior national correspondent Terry Moran, our thanks to you as always. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next half hour, we're live from Trump National Golf Club as he delivers his first remarks since being arraigned. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Tomorrow on Good Morning America, wake up with Selma Hayek. Good morning, America. And this week, Garth Brooks has something new to announce, and he's doing it on GMA. Plus, a super summer deals and steals. That is great. All on Good Morning America.
This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasure that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. It is a historic prosecution that Donald Trump is calling a persecution. We begin tonight with this poignant moment in American history. A former president in court today facing criminal charges from the very government he was once elected to lead. Today, Trump entered a plea of not guilty to a sprawling 37-count criminal indictment. Traveling to the Miami courthouse alone this afternoon, Trump was seen waving at the window. The former president was fingerprinted, but no mugshot was taken. Then, for the first time, Trump came face to face with special counsel Jack Smith. Magistrate Judge Jonathan Goodman, who oversaw the hearing, ordered Trump not to discuss the case with any witnesses. Outside of the court, there was a festive like atmosphere. Most of the hundreds who showed up were there to support Trump, while others were there in protest. So, what comes next as this historic legal showdown plays out right in the middle of the 2024 campaign season? Our team is standing by to break it all down tonight, and we begin with our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, in Miami. Donald Trump this morning walking to his motorcade at his Doral Resort, the former president riding alone, a brief wave to supporters, and a post on social media. On my way to the courthouse, witch hunt. The law is above the law. Outside federal court in Miami, a carnival-like atmosphere. Small groups of supporters and opponents, present but peaceful. Inside, Trump was arrested, fingerprinted electronically, but no mugshot, no handcuffs. He was not ordered to empty his pockets. In the courtroom, the former president found himself just steps away from the man prosecuting him, special counsel Jack Smith, who he has attacked in deeply personal terms. Smith sitting just one row behind Trump, glancing at the former president throughout the hearing, Trump never once looked back. Smith charging Trump with 37 criminal counts, accusing him of illegally keeping sensitive classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago resort in a storage area, a ballroom, even a bathroom. 
They allegedly included secrets about United States nuclear programs, potential vulnerabilities of the United States and its allies to military attack, and plans for possible retaliation in response to a foreign attack. Prosecutors argue Trump tried to obstruct the investigation by suggesting his attorney hide or destroy documents, allegedly asking the lawyer, wouldn't it be better if we just told them we don't have anything here? In court today, Trump saying not one word. His shoulders slumped, his arms crossed, his face stern. His lawyer entering his plea, not guilty. Sitting at the same table as the former president, one of his closest aides, Walt Nada, who has also been charged, allegedly conspiring with his boss to obstruct the investigation. Nata at Trump's side over the weekend. He rode in the motorcade today. But at the end of the hearing, the magistrate judge ordered Trump not to discuss the case with any potential witnesses, a group that would certainly include Nada. After about an hour in the courthouse, Trump and Nada leaving together, stopping at a Cuban restaurant in Little Havana. Food for everyone. Food for everyone. Trump sounding upbeat as he headed to the airport. I think it's going great. Okay, I think it's a rig deal here. And with one final wave, he was off. We'll be seeing a lot more of him for sure. Rachel Scott joins us now from Miami. Rachel, you were inside that courtroom today. We only have the sketches, but I have to imagine that it was quite a striking scene for you to witness with your own eyes. Mm -hmm. It was unprecedented, Lindsay. We have never seen anything like this before. And one thing that was striking, the special counsel, Jack Smith, repeatedly glancing over at former President Donald Trump. Trump never once turned around to look back at him. The former president did not utter a single word, but he did not have to. His arms were crossed. His shoulders were slumped. He had to wait about 15 minutes for the judge to start today's arraignment. And at times, he appeared restless, even fidgeting with his hands. One thing was very clear. Trump was ready to get this all over with and get back to his 2024 campaign, Lindsay. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. And now let's get right to ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky. Aaron, what are the next steps for Trump here? Well, at the moment, there's no next date in his case, but we imagine the judge will set one soon to start to lay out a motion schedule as the lawyers make their arguments. You could imagine former President Trump's legal team is already thinking about motions to dismiss the case or diminish the charges, maybe throw out certain evidence. Uh, we'll also see what the judge decides to do in terms of keeping the case here in downtown Miami or maybe moving it to Fort Pierce, north of here, where she usually is based. So there's all sorts of different machinations, but it's unlikely, Lindsay, we're going to see former President Trump in this courthouse again anytime soon, maybe not until trial, assuming the case gets that far. And Aaron, today Trump was also dealt a second legal blow. What are the details on that? Really stunning because it really underscores, Lindsay, just how many legal entanglements the former president is facing. As he was being arraigned on the indictment here in Miami, a federal judge in New York allowed E. Jean Carroll to amend an existing defamation lawsuit to include more comments that Trump made that were allegedly disparaging to her. These comments came after a jury found Trump liable of sexually assaulting Carroll back in the 1990s. He went on CNN, he went online, he made all these remarks. And now her lawsuit is going to include those remarks and seek $10 million in damages. So as he's fighting a criminal case, he also has civil lawsuits to tend to as well, Lindsay. Aaron Katursky, our thanks to you as always. Some Republican presidential hopefuls like Nikki Haley and Vivek Ramaswamy have floated pardons for Trump if he's convicted. Former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson, who's also running, told us that's a bad idea. It is wrong. Uh, it is unjustified. It is a bad precedent. Uh, they're politically pandering uh, to get votes using the federal pardon power. So, no, it incenses me as somebody who's had to use the pardon power as governor and respects that power as president, and you don't use it as a campaign uh, wedge issue or a campaign tool. So I'm offended by that as someone who loves our justice system in America, and it's wrong uh, for candidates to be promising that, whether it's to a former president or whether it's to an average Joe that's out there. Uh, you just don't do that during a campaign. 
I want our candidates to show more courage and to speak out about this and provide leadership. All right, now let's bring in ABC News legal contributor Khan Nowaday, a former federal prosecutor for the Southern District of New York. Khan, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, playing off of that pardons conversation there, if former President Trump is convicted but then gets reelected, would he effectively be able to pardon himself? Uh, I don't think he would be able to. I think that would, frankly, be quite unprecedented. But I know we are in uncharted waters. Um, but it is true, even if he's convicted, he can continue to run and he can be elected president, as he said he plans to do. Uh, Chris Christie, uh, obviously the former governor of New Jersey, presidential hopeful himself, has looked at the indictment and he said that it was inexcusable and called it vanity run amok. Uh, charges against the former president, uh, how strong would you say, based on the charges against the former president, how strong of a case would you say that the Justice Department has made in their 37 count indictment as far as the quality and, and quantity of evidence? It is so strong, Lindsay, uh, in my view. I do not envy uh, Trump's defense team. It is a very hard road to uh, overcome here. If the government's able to prove all the facts that they've alleged in the indictment, it's, in my mind, pretty much an open and shut case. So the case really depends on what these motions are going to be and what evidence may potentially be excluded. And in the motion practice, I think that's where the case may end up being won or lost. I want to give you one other quote, because we had former Trump Attorney General uh, Bill Barr, who said recently that it showed, quote, egregious obstruction, and that if even half of it is true, then he is toast. Would you say that that's a fair assessment? That is very fair. I think anybody who's prosecuted cases, anybody who has defended cases, would look at this indictment and say, oh, my goodness, this is a lot of evidence. And if it was any other person, uh, I think those defense counsel would be talking about a plea with the former president. How much of this comes down to intent on, on the part of the former president? This whole case depends on intent. And prior to uh, this indictment being filed and released, I think everyone knew that was the issue. And what this indictment shows is that, well, the prosecutors have very good evidence of intent. They have recordings. They have Mr. Trump allegedly um, showing classified documents to witnesses. I totally expect that those witnesses will end up being called to trial and will testify about that. So I think there's very strong evidence of intent. You know, a moment ago, you, you talked about in any other case, basically, with such strong evidence, you might be having the defense talking about a plea deal. You think there's any possible chance of that? Absolutely not. I, I don't see this. Uh, I, I don't even think that uh, DOJ would necessarily entertain a plea. Um, it's their discretion to uh, engage in plea discussions with any defendant. And he is the top defendant here. I think they will engage in plea discussions and potential cooperation with Walt Nada. What kind of strategy do you think that we can expect from both the DOJ and also from Trump's defense? I think from DOJ, they're going to want to move quickly. Uh, I think from de the defense side, I, I think in the defense's interest is that time is their friend. They're going to want to move slowly and deliberately. And I think they're also going to want to keep a unified front with uh, Walt Nada. Um, I think the biggest fear for the Trump defense team is that Nada flips on the former president. And what about the presiding judge in this case? She's a Trump appointee who's given him favorable rulings in the past. What kind of impact could she have on this case and, and how it moves forward? Well, first of all, it should not have any impact. She should be calling balls and strikes. She should be following the law. But, Lindsay, you're absolutely right. In a related case, she seemed to make very favorable rulings uh, in favor of the former president and rulings that did not follow the law. And that for that reason, she got reversed. So I think it remains to be seen how this will play out. But I think going forward, her rulings are going to be scrutinized, heavily scrutinized, as they should be. Khan Nowaday, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. And now let's go to our senior national correspondent, Terry Moran. Terry's back with us. Of course, Trump was stoic in court today, didn't utter a word. Moments after leading, he was seemed to be at least upbeat among the supporters there in Little Havana. Uh, the defendant versus the candidate. Is this something that we're going to continue to see, do you think? This kind Absolutely. of split screen? 
uh, split screen and the merging personality, the candidate is a defendant. And I think his whole plan of his campaign is to make this case the centerpiece of his message, which has been there really since he came down that elevator in 2015, which is that America is under attack from enemies within. Uh, that it is the last chance to save America, to make America great again. And uh, there are millions of people who believe that for reasons good and bad. People who feel that middle class and working class people don't have the same opportunities. People are concerned about the demographics and culture of the country changing. He brings all that together into this highly emotional, self-centered, literally centered on his own destiny uh, argument. And that will be his campaign. My prosecution is the persecution of you. Help me, you help yourself. Tonight's event was planned before the indictment, but in view of today's arraignment, what do you expect to see and, and hear from Trump tonight? Exactly that framing. I, I think it's going to be well staged. He's his, his own producer, as we know uh, beforehand, and I think he's going to be furious. He's going to want to depart from whatever script he's got and really vent, let loose his rage and his frustration uh, at, these, at these charges, at this pass that he's come to. I think the trick for him is going to be to keep people on board as the evidence comes out in court, as the jury, if there is a trial, renders its verdict. Can he keep them with him? Right now, it's easy to be angry at the charge of Trump if you're on his side. But if the evidence is as strong as Khan Nowaday and others have, have said, can you really maintain that anger on behalf of Trump, who did this to himself? You know, we keep talking about how we haven't seen anything like this, the unprecedented nature. You know, one thing that I think that is, is also something that I, is surprising many, is certainly Dr. Jill Biden uh, talked about her surprise last night, is that we continue to see, uh, even despite uh, these two arraignments at this point, that he has a widening gap. Trump is, is now leading by more. Uh, he's actually increased uh, his lead against Ron DeSantis. Is that also something that, that is just uh, so striking for our country right now? Uh, I, I think it speaks to the divide, doesn't it? That, that there is an assumption upon the majority, that means anybody who disagrees with their support of Trump uh, does, is illegitimate. That even the workings of a grand jury uh, in Florida is illegitimate. And unless Trump is acquitted, the case is illegitimate. And that is how he has bound the Republican Party to his own personal destiny, for better and worse. They won in 2016 with him. They lost in 2018, 2020, 2022 as well. ABC senior national correspondent Terry Moran, our thanks to you. Still much more to get to. Coming up, Mexico could have its first female president ever. Plus, Jeffrey host Ken Jennings joins us on the show's legacy and takes us on a journey through the afterlife. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? 
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Manhattan, I'm Diane Macedo. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko says Russian tactical nuclear weapons are due to be deployed in the country within days. The deployment will be Moscow's first move of the short-range warhead since the fall of the Soviet Union. It comes at the request of Lukashenko and in response to the U.S. deployment of similar weapons in Western Europe over many decades. The mayor of Mexico City announced that she will step down this Friday to seek the ruling party's presidential nomination. If elected, she would become the country's first female president. Early polls have shown Mayor Claudia Scheinbaum with a slight advantage in the race for the nomination. And BTS fans from around the world are gathering in Seoul to celebrate the K-pop boy band's 10th anniversary. The city illuminated landmarks and the group's signature color purple in tribute. BTS is taking a temporary break as two of the members complete their military service. But that is not stopping their army from flocking to celebrate their favorite idols. Our next guest is taking us on a journey through the afterlife, exploring 5,000 years of human history from the ancient Egyptian underworld to the literary world of C.S. Lewis's Narnia. And he also happens to be the host of Jeopardy. Ken Jennings has no limits in his new book, 100 Places to See After You Die. Thank you so much for joining us, Ken. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So the basic premise here is the bucket list after you've kicked the bucket. I I explain how you came up with this idea. Well, I was in an airport and I saw one of those travel guides. You know, they always have these books that tell you a thousand things you have to do before you die. But for some reason, I was looking at it upside down and I thought it said a thousand places to die before you see. And I thought, hey, that would be a book, you know, instead of a travel guide to Rome or Thailand, you know, it's, it's where to eat in Dante's Inferno or where to stay in Valhalla or the good place. I always loved these fictional depictions of heaven and hell when I was a kid. And you really delve into all these different iterations of death and the afterlife that, as we've seen it depicted in movies and books and TV shows. How did you go about researching this? It was research intensive. I mean, I didn't actually die and come back, but I did spend a lot of time in libraries looking up old Buddhist sutras and ancient um, medieval texts of uh, mystics who said they'd been to the next world watched every episode, you know, binged every episode of TV shows about the next world, like Leftovers or The Good Place or Dead Like Me. Um, I feel like I am ready to go whenever, you know, if, I, if a bus hits me today, I know more than I, I ever needed to. Have you, did you interview anybody who says that they have died and came back? I wanted to stay away from that because it's kind of a, that's a different kind of book, you know, okay. the people who, who have these firsthand testimonies. I guess I did for people who had lived like hundreds of years ago. Mm -hmm. Like Emanuel Swedenborg wrote a very detailed book about here are the little communities that form after death and you can even get married and here's what the language sounds like. It's a little bit like Hebrew. A lot of these places have enough detail in them that you can, you can write about them like it's a travel guide. And you actually have a quote here from uh, Harry Potter and, and I want to read it here uh, talking about the afterlife. Of course it's happening inside your head but why on earth should that mean that it is not real? Do you believe that the afterlife exists? I think there's something to that. I would say my conviction about the afterlife is I'm very hopeful about it because it, it just seems like it, it's such a waste if we're here and we're conscious and then it all, it all just goes away. Um, so I would love for that to be true. But even if it's not, it can still be real, like the Harry Potter quote says. You know, it kind of determines how we live, live our lives here, what we value. Our afterlives say a lot about our culture, and then they determine our culture. And you're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's true, born and raised. How did your faith play into how you went about writing and approaching this book? I guess it makes me open-minded and curious about religion in a way that not everybody is. You know, I'm willing to, I, I love the fascinating little bits about Hindu heaven or, uh, or Muslim hell or whatever, because they remind me about the little details and folklore in my own Sunday school uh, lessons back in the day. 
I, I just find you personally fascinating because I'm the person watching Jeopardy at home that gets like three right, and I'm <laughs> thrilled at that. And we were saying how you were doing that and just getting them all right. How has this gone from being the ordinary guy sitting on the couch answering all the Jeopardy questions correctly to the winningest Jeopardy contestant ever to now host of host. Jeopardy? I can't believe it. It feels like it must be a prank. And at some point, they're going to reveal what's been going on. I, it was always my favorite show as a kid. It was, it felt like a safe space to be smart. You know, on Jeopardy, people were celebrated for knowing things, which didn't always seem to be true in real life America. And, and that meant a lot to me. And the fact that I can now still go to work there, I feel... I feel so lucky. I feel like the little kid that won the chocolate factory. Now, my one game show that I've always been pretty good at, an RSTLNE, that, you know, before yes. they even gave you, I would, I would always pick those and, and kind of be able to, in my mind, decide that I was able to get, solve the answer. We just recently heard that Pat Sajak is going to retire. Did you grow up watching? I mean, it feels like the end of an era. It really does. For Pat and Alex to be gone within just a few years, I mean, that was America's evening for almost 40 years. And as we saw in Jeopardy, it's very difficult to navigate that transition, right. you know, because people are used to those hosts and they feel like they were guests in their homes for, for those decades. You learn anything from Pat Sajak? Yeah, absolutely. Watching him, even watching him as a kid, you know, he was very different than Alex. Alex was beautiful at keeping the game running seriously and smoothly, but Pat always had a little joke, you know. Pat was obviously a quick thinker, and that's not always right for Jeopardy, but I have Pat in the back of my mind sometimes when I, when I see a chance to, to make a little joke. Well, Jeopardy host Ken Jennings, we thank you so much. And we want to let our viewers know that his book, 100 Places to See After You Die, is now available wherever books are sold. And still to come, we'll bring you the sweet story of a community center that rallied behind a Marine and left him feeling on cloud nine. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Finally, tonight, a wish granted. 80-year-old John Brees spent most of his adult life flying planes. He recently got the chance to get back into the cockpit and in flight again, thanks to the Tree of Dreams at a retirement community in Omaha, Nebraska. Reporter Cal Larson from our partner station, KETV, has his story. Anytime you get near an airplane, I'm always excited. I never have been not excited around airplanes. John Brees has piloted more flights than he can count. I would have always flown. You know, I, I, well, I wanted to fly all my life. From being a lamplighter pilot in the Marines to giving lessons for the extension service, Tuesday morning, Brees was a pilot yet again. He described the feeling pre-flight. Something comes over you and just takes any stress or whatever just drains it away. And that's the feeling. And I can't really, I don't have the words to describe it if I, I wish I had the words. 
Reese was able to get in this plane thanks to a program at Crown Point Retirement Community called Tree of Dreams. Elizabeth Wells helps run the program. He wanted to get up in the air one more time and so we are going to do that for him today. Sending Brees up in flight is the first wish Crown Point has granted. This means a ton to him because he wants to feel like he is back in his glory days. As the plane touched down and taxied back to its spot, Brees stepped off the plane and cracked a joke when asked if he'd go back up anytime soon. Yeah, I'll go right now. In fact, I was going to run inside and see what Bob's got an inventory in there. <laughs> Except everyone knows he wasn't joking. Oh, so happy to see him back in the air again. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. Have a great night. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. You never know what you're gonna get on this show. That's all I'm gonna tell you. Yes, Whoopi! Is this mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely, always. absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right, they don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Good evening. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. It is a historic prosecution that Donald Trump is calling a persecution. We begin tonight with this poignant moment in American history. A former president in court today facing criminal charges from the government that he was once elected to lead. Today, Trump entered a plea of not guilty to a sprawling 37-count criminal indictment. Let's take a live look now from Trump's property in Bedminster, New Jersey, where the former president is set to speak just in the next few minutes. This comes after Trump's appearance inside of Miami court earlier today. Trump's motorcade is currently on the way to his property. You're taking a live look right now. And we want to go live to Jay O'Brien, who's been at Trump National Golf Club in Bedminster, New Jersey, all day today. Jay, uh, thanks for joining us. Give us a, a lay of the land there right now. Yeah, Lindsay, we are waiting for the former president. Now, the doors here just behind me just opened not long ago to reveal those American flags inside. The podium was set up a while back. This is a crowd 
crowd of donors, of Trump supporters, of some minor celebrities in MAGA world, the likes of Sebastian Gorka and Mike Lindell in the crowd tonight. We've seen one lawmaker, one elected member of Congress from what I've seen, which is Tommy Tuberville, the senator from Alabama. But this is also a fundraiser, Lindsay. These are donors who had a pre-planned event for tonight here at Trump's club in, Je in Bedminster, New Jersey, a sign that we have now shifted in our conversation as it comes after this arraignment, that there was that stoic scene in federal court today, a former president brought up on federal charges, serious federal charges that have to do with the handling of classified information. And now as we go from the day into the evening, we are here in what has all the makings of a political atmosphere, as you can see the crowd get revved up behind me. We heard Terry Moran describe it and put it really so eloquently earlier today, saying that he's making his personal trial part of his political identity. What do we expect to hear from the former president tonight? Well, exactly in that vein is what we're expecting to hear from the former president. The word that keeps repeatedly get thrown, getting thrown around is defiant. It's the exact same word that was used to characterize the former president's remarks after he was arraigned on those New York charges that related to the hush money Stormy Daniels payments. Now what the former president is facing are much more serious federal charges. He is holding another speech after another arraignment. And again, he is expected to be defiant. He is expected expected to attack the special counsel, expected to attack the Department of Justice and make this not necessarily about the specific facts of the case, as we even saw his legal team do outside that arraignment today, but make this about the politics of it all, make it about his supporters and his ongoing campaign to be president again. And Trump has been warned about what interactions with witnesses he's allowed to have. I explain what he was told in court. Well, that makes things extremely complicated. So the judge who arraigned the former president, the magistrate in this case, said that he wasn't supposed to have conversations about this case with witnesses in that in this case. That's complicated. For, that is complicated for a few reasons. The first is his co-defendant and other witnesses in this case currently work for the former president, or in some cases they are former employees of the former president. In other cases, we know that there are some people in this crowd tonight who have testified before the grand jury that was impaneled as it relates to this case. And we also know that former President Trump tends to say what's on his mind, especially behind closed doors and even not behind closed doors. So all of that, those instructions from the judge get very complicated here as we progress. And as the former president embarks as an ongoing federal criminal defendant on his 2024 run for the White House yet again. Jay O'Brien, our thanks to you. We'll be coming back to you once he starts speaking. And I'd like to bring in ABC's Catherine Falders, who's in Washington for us. Catherine, as Trump faced these charges today, he's still working to build out his legal team. What's the latest on where that stands tonight? That's right. He had two lawyers with him in Florida court today that represent him actually in different matters uh, in New York. Those lawyers were Todd Blanche and Chris Kyes sitting at that table with him. We know uh, that they have been interviewing lawyers over the course of several weeks, actually more informally. But over this past weekend and even on Monday, Trump was down there with his lawyers interviewing uh, additional lawyers that they wanted uh, to join this legal team. But that search, Lindsay, is still ongoing. There's a lot of lawyers, many attorneys who understand how Trump is as a client, who see that a lot of lawyers who have worked with him have quit, including the three uh, most recently that quit this case in particular. So we know that this search uh, is ongoing. His team is continuing uh, to interview additional lawyers. But this is a matter that is going to require a lot of legal firepower. This isn't just a matter of hiring uh, one more person, if you will. This needs to be a team of people. A lot of uh, defense attorneys I've talked to acknowledge that. They need people with national security experience. They don't have that right now. So again, this is ongoing, and they hope to find somebody in the coming days. And what about that key aide, Walt Nauta? Uh, we saw him right by Trump's side today. What comes next for him on the charges uh, that he faces and now making his own defense?
Yeah, Nada played a crucial role in this alleged scheme, uh, and he helped Trump move boxes, move documents. That's what Jack Smith lays out in this indictment here. In terms of what comes next, obviously, he is facing six charges. He was there in that room with Trump today with his lawyer, one of his lawyers, Stanley Woodward, who represented him in this matter when it was in Washington, D.C. Uh, but the problem here is, Lindsay, that Nada does not have local Florida counsel. So he, of course, has asked for his arraignment to be delayed. This was the initial appearance. He's asked for the arraignment to be delayed. So essentially what happens next here is he's been told by the judge that he will need to return in two weeks to be arraigned once he finds local counsel who can represent him. All right, Catherine Falders for us in Washington. Thanks so much. Now I want to bring back in ABC's John Santucci. John, what are you hearing from those close to Trump as far as his reaction to that court appearance and the charges he faces? Well, when he first left court, you know, obviously the demeanor to which uh, our Rachel Scott and others reported uh, was where he was. He was very angry leaving court, um, you know, did not enjoy that experience at all. Defiant. I think many people defiant, um, but, but quiet, you know, taking it all in. And then that campaign stop that he made in Little Havana right after, that buoyed him. That, that kind of bolstered his spirits a little bit. He was on uh, the flight back uh, to New Jersey, uh, surrounded by a team. One person told me, it's like a party in here. There's so many people. They, they just sort of crammed everybody in. Uh, McDonald's was served to everybody on board, his <laughs> typical meal of choice, as we both know, uh, as he watched news coverage of the day's events. Um, but now they're expecting that this is gonna be the former president that we all know. He's gonna get to this podium, he is going to sound off. He is going to go at special counsel Jack Smith, go at others. I think what's really going to be curious right now is the things, quite frankly, I wish we could see. I wish we were a fly on the wall in Bedminster tonight because that order you talked about with Jay earlier, not to talk with witnesses, that event, and we're looking at the pictures of it, those are people uh, there, many of whom have been witnesses, have been contacted by the special counsel's team. So Trump not talking to them about the day's events is going to be extremely hard mm -hmm. to believe. And we see that uh, Trump's motorcade is now uh, arriving at the golf club there. Do you think that the message will be any different at all from uh, the one that he delivered the night after he was uh, arraigned here in New York? No, I, I think it's going to be rinse, repeat, here we go again. And, you know, the imagery of tonight, that picture, it, it's just, it's a throwback for me. And when someone told me about it, they said, think of transition. Think of when Donald Trump was president-elect Donald Trump in the winter of 2016. He'd bring everybody right there, Lindsay, that spot. He'd bring them up by the door and show his future cabinet picks or people he was interviewing. They're trying to create these moments. Donald Trump believes he is a TV producer. That's tonight's television production. He wants people to think of him as the president. Those images that evoke those memories of yesteryear, as he says, the old days, the good old days. That is a sight that, that is so many of us remember from the freezing cold of being out in Bedminster. I mean, really like a, a split second glance and you look like, you're, it looks like the White House. Looks it it like looks like with the White Columns and, the, and all of the yeah. American uh, flags there. John Santucci, our, our thanks to you as always. We wanna go now uh, back to Jay O'Brien, who's been at Trump National Golf Club in Bedminster, New Jersey all day. Uh, Jay, the motorcade has just arrived. What are you seeing? Yeah, and we've been talking, Lindsay, about the politics of this all and how the former president is going to try to use this in the public sphere while he's also engaging in a defense from criminal allegations from the special counsel. And the politics of this is playing out right before us. So the Trump motorcade just pulled in moments ago. You can first tell by the news helicopters that began hovering above us, the shot of which I think that you have. Those helicopters, we started to hear their rudders, and then we saw the Trump motorcade pull in right behind my camera here. The crowd cheered as he did that, and now the former president is expected to take the stage any moment. And again, as you heard John and Catherine lay out what are expected to be defiant remarks, and uh, uh, him expected to, create, to continue the message that he is not backing down, that he will continue this run for the White House yet again, despite now facing local criminal charges, federal criminal charges, and other investigations in places like Fulton County, Georgia, for instance. And we saw the crowds in Florida for him. As we've been talking to John Santucci, he really seems to enjoy that. We see the crowds now again gathered in New Jersey. Just remind us of the kind of people who get the invite to be present at tonight's event. 
it, 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 exactly, Lindsay. And the other thing it's worth pointing out here is that this is an after party for a federal arraignment. There was a reception earlier behind the club here. There were drinks served. We've seen people in the crowd who've been eating and drinking. There are people with MAGA hats and there are people handing out MAGA hats. There's obviously music playing as you can hear here. And it is a stark difference between, again, the stoic scene that we saw in federal court today. Defendant former president Donald Trump looking down, not making eye contact with the special counsel. Uh, our colleagues describing him as having a frown on his face now coming here to what is again a lively political crowd and expected to deliver remarks a much different scene than what was seen in that federal courthouse in Miami today yeah really interesting the way you put it and an after party basically to Anna Remy I want to bring back in John Santucci and John I remember you and all you and I were sitting right here right after his arraignment in New York where we we were really struck by the idea that he was by himself in the car yeah no Melania no nope. kids nope. no advisors nope. with him same scene again today. Yeah, rinse, repeat. You would have thought you were in Manhattan minus the temperature. Um, th this is absolutely a rinse and repeat as far as what we've seen so far. And even tonight, Lindsay, um, I know that uh, only one of Donald Trump's children traveled with him back to Bedminster, that is Eric Trump, uh, who's actually been the least political mm. of the three adult children. He really stayed back behind to run the Trump organization. Ivanka Trump, who frankly, in moments like this, the tough moments, the tense moments, we would have seen Ivanka and her husband, Jared Kushner, right by the former president in the old days. Uh, they are nowhere to be found. They are and, not in this. And, and what's the plan? Are, are we expecting, literally, as he just has pulled up, that he's essentially going to go and address the crowd right yeah, away? Yeah, quite literally. I mean, think about it how when we see him land his Trump Force One on the campaign trail. They're going to pull him up. It's expected he's going to get right out, start speaking. Uh, we've been getting real-time communications from his team saying, we're coming, this is the time. Slid a little bit because they left Miami later than they had expected. But he wants to get out there and speak. We're told the speech is going to be about 20 25 minutes. Um, interestingly, though, most times we get some excerpt, some idea of what he's going to say. Nada. Have not heard a thing. I somewhat have a little speculation they might have been working on this on the plane because, listen, Donald Trump, as we know, is changing things in real time every couple of seconds. And he takes a lot of advice in part from the people that he always said he talked to, which were folks on television. So him on the plane, he's flipping through the channels. He's hearing commentary. He's probably hearing buzzwords that are angering him, but also buzzwords from his Fox News fan club that he'd like to add in. So tweaking, adjusting, moving every moment. And then obviously we know him. He's going to wing it off the cuff. And, and likely, even though, again, you haven't gotten those little snippets as you normally would, do you suspect that he's going to use this to raise some campaign funds? Absolutely. Well, you have to remember, this event actually was already pre-programmed. They had programmed a donor event tonight at Bettminster. They were expecting three to 400 people. And then this all just sort of happened, right? We didn't know this was going to happen a week ago this time. So this comes down. They add on to the donor event. So there still is a full setup inside Bedminster. This, as Jay noted earlier, they built this stage outside. And once again, as we are taking a live look, expecting uh, former President Donald Trump to come before that podium and address the crowd that's assembled there at any moment. In the meantime, I want to bring back in uh, ABC News uh, senior national correspondent Terry Moran. And uh, Terry, as John was just saying, tonight's event was planned before the indictment. But in view of today's arraignment, uh, what do you expect to hear and, and see from Donald Trump? Well, I think he's going to vent his his anger, his sense of outrage, and try to connect that uh, to the sense of anger that's latent in the American Republic that he's 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 tapped into so frequently that American carnage uh, feeling that the country's on the wrong track that he delivered it in his inaugural address, and now he's going to link that to his own personal fortunes. Look, they're coming after me because they're coming after you. But what I'm seeing here, look at him. He is the best show in television, in political television. Always has been. One of, has, yeah, would we see, cover any other candidate like this? Uh, no. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Terry, for a moment. Just you, you see the the former president taking it all in. Uh, you have to imagine that he, that he's uh, encouraged uh, by seeing this crowd, despite the the day that he's had, as as Rachel Scott described him uh, in in court with the slumped shoulders and uh, and not talking at all, not uttering a, a single word. And now uh, he has this crowd assembled before him 
chanting his name, excited, taking his picture, waving, uh, really eager to, to hear what he has to say. Because he's always been a showman. They love that. He's the most fun candidate. He says that in his rallies. John will confirm that again and again. Have you ever had any more fun at a political rally? That's, he knows he's an entertainer uh, as well as uh, a political figure unlike any we've seen. And now, you know, a federal criminal defendant. John, you have to imagine that, that he's enjoying this moment. As Terry said, that line is true. I heard it too many times, Terry, uh, that have you ever had more fun than any other rally than Donald Trump's? Um, I think he's enjoying it, but at the same time, knowing Donald Trump, he is saying to himself, how do we end up here? Mm. I, I mean, th that does weigh on him a great deal, because keep in mind also, you know, there had been a core team of advisors that he called the day one club, the people that had been with him from the beginning. Nobody in the day one club is there on this day. They are all gone. Some of these people uh, now on not on speaking terms uh, with the <clears throat> former president as he's about to take the podium. Um, and that, I think, it, is hard for him. You know, he's had moments where he's looked around and wanted to go to people that he does trust, that he does rely on. We know that he is a guy that looks around every 10 seconds and says to somebody, what do you think? Um, and some of those people that were part of the day one club they were considered, Lindsay, the guardrails for Donald Trump, stopping him from his worst behavior. They're not there anymore. All right, we're going to take a listen to former President Donald Trump. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. It's a great honor to have you here. And Today we witnessed the most evil and heinous abuse of power in the history of our country. Very sad thing to watch. A corrupt sitting president had his top political opponent arrested on fake and fabricated charges of which he and numerous other presidents would be guilty. Right in the middle of a presidential election in which he is losing very badly. This is called election interference and yet another attempt to rig and steal a presidential election. More importantly, it's a political persecution like something straight out of a fascist or a communist nation. This day will go down in infamy and Joe Biden will forever be remembered as not only the most corrupt president in the history of our country, but perhaps even more importantly, the president, who together with a band of his closest thugs, misfits, and Marxists, tried to destroy American democracy. But they will fail, and we will win bigger and better. Out for a moment and, and go back to, to Terry, our ABC senior national correspondent. Terry, uh, there we have it. Uh, it's almost textbook Trump at this point, where he talks about the most evil and heinous abuse of power, fake and fabricated news, suggesting that this is politically motivated, going back to the idea uh, that this is a yet another attempt to rig or steal an election, though there has never been any evidence to support that there has been any uh, election uh, that was stolen in the last cycle. Uh, your response to how he came right out of the gate well he's furious obviously and he is counting on his fury to find its way into the hearts of his supporters and beyond because this is one of the things he said which is true it is it is unprecedented and it is not a great thing for the country it may be necessary but for the sitting president's administration to indict his predecessor and the le his leading opponent. That's the kind of thing we'd think we'd find in Argentina or some such place. Instead, here it is happening in the United States. Once again, it may be justified, but for millions of Americans, that's going to seem very, very strange. And here he is. This, get used to it. This is what we're going to hear for months. Now, the problem is to call Joe Biden, you know, all the names that he called him, is, is difficult to make stick. It's one of the frustrations of Republicans. Many people don't support him, obviously, but hate him. He's hard to hate, and Republicans have tried. Uh, and one of Biden's strengths is that he seems to many, many people, most Americans, whatever they think of his performance in office, you know, not hateful. And Biden needs people to hate him, to believe this hateful lie that he's telling, that, that Joe Biden handled this indictment. He had nothing to do with it.
I just want to bring you back in, John, for a second, because what we're hearing right off the, out of the gate, as uh, as Terry Moran was just mentioning, where he's talking about how Joe Biden is losing very badly, and then suggesting that that's the reason that that he, you know, this is politically motivated. Yet the polls seem to give him what he wants, and that even from the last arraignment, he's actually uh, gotten a wider uh, spread, wider advantage uh, over over Ron DeSantis. You know, but. That's the polls now. This is June of 2023. We have 18 months to go. How is this show going to continue? Listen, I, I covered Donald Trump, as you know, for two years on the road. I heard the speech, I heard the shtick every day. But what Donald Trump did effectively in 2015 and 2016, he talked about people's problems. He talked about the issues that were going on in the day and he related it back to them. That is not what a speech like this is and that is not something sustainable. If you are a farmer and your crops have gone because of a drought, how does this help you? If you cannot afford your taxes, if you have problems with your child's school, paying their tuition, safety, this does not help you. And aides that no longer work for Donald Trump, but try to help him, because as somebody said to me, you know, I'm not going back, but I feel something for him. I feel that connection to him. They have picked up the phone, they have told him, you've got to start talking about what worked well for you in act one. He doesn't want to do it. John Santucci, Terry Moran, our thanks to both of you. Now we want to bring back in former Republican Congresswoman Barbara Comstock. Uh, thank you again for joining us tonight. Uh, what's your reaction to, to Trump's in initial comments tonight? Well, listen, it's just a bad rerun of the same old, you know, self-pity, vindictive, uh, boring, you know, talking about himself. John's exactly right. You know, there's there's nothing here for the American people. And I think, uh, you know, you had on Asa Hutchinson before talking about, you know, we need to see, you know, people who are going to show some courage and talk about the seriousness of this case. And I think people are slow, even Republicans are slowly and surely going to realize there is seriousness about this case and that this is an unserious person who is just focused on self-pity and on himself. And I think it's very telling that his family is not there with him. His wife was apparently getting her hair done today, not there with him in court. And that only one son is there with him. And that he has no chiefs of staff that he had are there. You know, none of his former lawyers are there with him. And it's just really kind of pathetic. It reminds me of the end of that 50s movie, you know, A Face in the Crowd when he was just kind of falling apart. And so... I do think it's time for other Republicans, uh, you know, like I said, mentioned to step up and be courageous. I certainly hope courage will be contagious. Um, you know, you've seen Asa from the beginning step out and say this. I remind people, I mean, Asa is a friend of mine, but he was out there prosecuting, you know, Bill Clinton and someone from his own state. You know, Chris Christie's out there now. Others are stepping up. Lisa Murkowski was out there today saying we've got to take this seriously. Don Bacon of Nebraska was saying, you know, there's no excuse for this. And I think you're going to see more and more there because this is a boring, self-centered man who just he's spent. <laughs> and we we need to turn the page. And he's going to lose in a general election. Whether or not he wins a primary, he is does not have the energy or the moral character to win a general election. And if Republicans can't turn the page, you know, as, as Chris Christie said last night, he's been losing since 2016. Loser, loser, loser. Look at that screen. He is a loser. You know, we, you know, all he does is focus on himself, and that's not the winning strategy to bring in all those swing states that he lost for the past three cycles. What impact do you see the charges having on the Republican primary campaign? That, that what? This charges? I mean, it's, it's having a big impact. And, and if these other candidates won't step up and, and talk about it, um, then they're going to hand him the nomination and... and hand the election uh, to, to Joe Biden. 
and, and you know it'll be their own there. Fault. I mean, are you are you surprised, Barbara, to, to see many of the the same Republican hopefuls who are running for president who are saying, oh, you know, if elected, I would pardon him? That, that are kind of pandering to to the Trump voter. Well, I think it's uh, well. Asa is exactly right on that. That is disgraceful. I mean, pardoning somebody is a very, first of all. You pardon somebody if they accept guilt and they say they're wrong, you know, or, you know, if you have, you know, somebody who's been wrongfully accused, say a murderer, and you read the file and you realize this person did not commit a murder, you know, this is a really powerful tool that a governor or a president has to use it. You know, Asa was exactly right to use it. So, you know, for pandering for political votes is just disgraceful. So I am, you know, Asa is exactly right on that. And I, and Lisa Murkowski talked about that today. And that Vivek, you know, Ramaswani talking about that was just pathetic today. I mean, just, you know, a, a fool to use that in that way. And that's disgraceful. So no, uh, that should not be used in that way. And we need this is a time when we need serious people. And this is someone who's petty and vindictive, Donald Trump. And he will use, as, as Chris Christie said last night, he will use, if he's ever president again, he would use his powers both domestically and foreign against his enemies. Imagine what he would do for, against his foreign enemies. What would he do to, um, you know, to President Zelensky, to our NATO allies? It would be frightening um, what this man would do. And he should never have the reins of power again because of how dangerous it would be. Uh, both on the domestic and the foreign front. So, you know, people need to stand up. And, you know, this is a very critical time, and we cannot afford to have such a, a dangerous person with no respect for the Constitution who every day is attacking the rule of law in our justice system. And I appreciate that we have prosecutors like Asa, like Chris Christie, and other lawyers, Republicans who respect the rule of law, who are willing to take the political consequences of speaking out and saying we need to uh, speak out against this, uh, you know, unconstitutional fraud. Barbara Comstock, former Republican Congresswoman from Virginia, we thank you so much for your time. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. Have a great night. Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. It is a historic prosecution that Donald Trump tonight is saying is a persecution. And we begin tonight with this poignant moment in American history. A former president in court today facing criminal charges from the government he was once elected to lead. Today, Trump entered a plea of not guilty to a sprawling 37-count criminal indictment. Speaking in Bedminster, New Jersey tonight, Trump was defiant. The most evil and heinous abuse of power in the history of our country. Very sad thing to watch a corrupt sitting president had his top political opponent arrested on fake and fabricated charges of which he and numerous other presidents would be guilty right in the middle of a presidential election. 
Earlier today, Trump traveled to the Miami courthouse alone. Trump was seen waving out the window. The former president was fingerprinted, but no mugshot was taken. Then for the first time, Trump came face to face with special counsel Jack Smith. Magistrate Judge Jonathan Goodman, who oversaw the hearing, ordered Trump not to discuss the cases with any witnesses outside of the court. There was a festive feeling and atmosphere there. Most of the hundreds who showed up were there to support Trump, while others were there in protest. So what comes next is this historic legal showdown play out in the middle of the 2024 campaign season. Our team is standing by to break it all down tonight, and we begin with our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, in Miami. Donald Trump this morning walking to his motorcade at his Doral Resort, the former president riding alone, a brief wave to supporters, and a post on social media. On my way to the courthouse, witch hunt. Outside federal court in Miami, a carnival-like atmosphere. Small groups of supporters and opponents, present but peaceful. Inside, Trump was arrested, fingerprinted electronically, but no mugshot, no handcuffs. He was not ordered to empty his pockets. In the courtroom, the former president found himself just steps away from the man prosecuting him, special counsel Jack Smith, who he has attacked in deeply personal terms. Smith sitting just one row behind Trump, glancing at the former president throughout the hearing, Trump never once looked back. Smith charging Trump with 37 criminal counts, accusing him of illegally keeping sensitive classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago resort, in a storage area, a ballroom, even a bathroom. They allegedly included secrets about United States nuclear programs, potential vulnerabilities of the United States and its allies to military attack, and plans for possible retaliation in response to a foreign attack. Prosecutors argue Trump tried to obstruct the investigation by suggesting his attorney hide or destroy documents, allegedly asking the lawyer, wouldn't it be better if we just told them we don't have anything here? In court today, Trump saying not one word. His shoulders slumped, his arms crossed, his face stern. His lawyer entering his plea, not guilty. Sitting at the same table as the former president, one of his closest aides, Walt Nada who has also been charged, allegedly conspiring with his boss to obstruct the investigation. Nata at Trump's side over the weekend. He rode in the motorcade today. But at the end of the hearing, the magistrate judge ordered Trump not to discuss the case with any potential witnesses, a group that would certainly include Nata. After about an hour in the courthouse, Trump and Nada leaving together, stopping at a Cuban restaurant in Little Havana. Food for everyone. Food for everyone. Trump sounding upbeat as he headed to the airport. I think it's going great. Okay, let's I think it's a rig deal here. And with one final wave, he was off. Rachel Scott, our thanks to her. And now let's get straight to ABC senior national correspondent Terry Moran. Terry, what's the takeaway from Trump's comments at tonight's event? Well, then we better fasten our seatbelts because we're going to hear a lot more like that. What Donald Trump is trying to do is turn his own rages and hatreds into the platform of the Republican Party. He wants Republicans to buy into his view that this prosecution and all others, that any questioning of him at all is an attack on them, on the voters who chose him in 2016, who stood by him in 2020 and are still with him today. And that is his strategy. That's his strategy for political success. We'll see if it works. That's his strategy for survival in court. If he can convince Republicans to go along with him, if he can convince voters or other candidates and Republicans win, he'll get off. And I, I think that's in his mind. But there's no question that he wants to hardwire his own fury into his voters. As we've been discussing all night, Trump really seems to be making this indictment a cornerstone of his campaign. You've been talking about strategy. How likely is that strategy to work for him? You know, it and on the conduct of this trial, if Americans, including many who voted for Donald Trump, see this trial as an ordinary federal trial, despite its extraordinary circumstances, by that I mean Evidence comes in according to the rules of evidence. The judge seems fair, and the proceedings are like any other criminal uh, case. I think most Americans who are still pretty confident in the workings of the justice system are going to drift away from Trump, in part, in part because he's now imprisoned in this as his argument. What is he saying 
about their problems, not his problems, about their problems. And that's, that in the end could be decisive. America's a tomorrow-oriented country. He's talking about himself and about yesterday. And in contrast to the upbeat and defiant candidate that Trump, uh, Trump that we saw tonight in court today, uh, he was stoic and silent, letting his attorney enter his plea on, on his behalf. Is that a reflection, do you think, of, of the serious nature of the charges that he faces? It is, and it is consistent with the, with the behavior of every defendant I've seen in criminal cases. I've seen lots of criminal trials, and I must say, regardless of the circumstances of the crimes that the person is accused of, I always felt compassion for someone standing there. The whole world is coming down around, uh, on them, especially in federal court. This is the government of the United States prosecuting you. They don't lose very much, and they have clearly got their ducks in a row here. And so what you're seeing there is not only his awareness of the seriousness of the charges, but of his own personal peril. He is facing the prospect, doubt it would happen to a first offender, but you never know, of dying in prison because of the seriousness of these charges and the sentences that they carry. Uh, really grim to, to think about it that way. Uh, former Governor Chris Christie last night uh, accused Trump of, of thrusting the nation into another extraordinarily divisive moment. The political divide is already so wide in this country. Uh, do you expect, Terry, that this is just going to make it even wider? I, it'll make it sharper, that's for sure. The, the tens of millions of Americans who stand by Donald Trump no matter what are going to be whipped into a fury by what happens to him in this case and in others. Remember, there's more coming, uh, not just in New York, but possibly in Atlanta, and then the January 6th special counsel investigation. He's gonna have a lot of legal trouble. It will increase the divide there. But I think, once again, I think most Americans are looking for answers to today's issues, their challenges in their lives today. Not just that they support Donald Trump and they don't like what's happening to him, but how are they gonna pay for health care for their parents or, or college for their kids. Those are going to be the issues that Donald Trump is going to have to offer something more than his own rage and hatreds. ABC senior national correspondent Terry Moran, our thanks to you. I want to bring back in ABC's John Santucci. John, we saw the former president's uh, remarks tonight once again, calling this a, a, a political persecution, yeah. suggesting uh, that, the, uh, again, that the election had been stolen before. This is another attempt to steal it. it are critics just going to say, look, this is he's a one-trick pony. This is all we're going to be able to get from him for the duration of this campaign. Well, it's not even critics. It's so far, it's all we've seen, right? I mean, he launched his campaign November 2022. So far, we've been on the trail for roughly seven months. And when he is out, when he's talking, this is the only thing that is sticking out because it's all he focuses on. He focuses on the investigations and he focuses on as he says, rigged, stolen election of the past, can't let that happen again. If those are the only two soundtracks that we're going to hear for the next 18 months, you got to imagine that people are going to get bored by it. So they've got to find a way to punch through it. They have a small campaign team right now. He does not want to make it much bigger, but that is something that people are impressing upon him, that if you do want to do that, because you need two things here to punch through, right? You need voters, you need supporters, you need donors. And that is what the big event tonight is. Because remember, though he's doing this event at Bedminster, this event was originally designed as a donor event. It was on the calendar weeks ago. It was supposed to happen. So they know, Team Trump, that that is the other side of the puzzle here. They need to have the money come in. They are going to have a lot of expenses coming up. Donald Trump knows what it's like to campaign for president. He's done it twice. It does require support, requires the funds. What are you hearing from uh, Trump viewer sources within the Trump uh, circle as far as his reaction to today's uh, court appearance and the charges against him? Well, defiant is the word that everybody keeps using with me. They said afterwards he was quiet, calm. Uh, that stop at that restaurant in Little Havana in Miami uh, bolstered him quite a bit, brought his spirits up. And then uh, traveling back up to New Jersey, he was surrounded by aides, allies, advisors. Uh, only one member of the Trump family was on the flight, Eric Trump, uh, and everybody had McDonald's, a signature meal for the former president, uh, as he was watching news coverage. But I do think, Lindsay, overall, the heaviness of this. It is all weighing on Donald Trump. And they know right now that the thing they need to do is bolster the legal team. We know that they went down to Florida a day before this indictment because they needed to bring more members onto the team. Interviews were happening on Monday and earlier on Tuesday. A team is still not set.
John Santucci, our thanks to you. Thank you. And now let's bring in ABC News legal contributor Khan Nowaday, a former federal prosecutor for the Southern District of New York. Khan, thanks for coming back. As the former President uh, Trump uh, just finished up his speech tonight, uh, can public statements that he's making go forward potentially impact the trial and the charges that he faces? Um, they could. Uh, I, I think we know that uh, Donald Trump is an evidence-creating machine. Every time he opens his mouth, DOJ is going to be listening. Prosecutors all across the country in Georgia and New York are going to be listening. So it's very perilous for him to be speaking. From what I heard, however, of what he spoke about tonight, seems to me that he's actually following his defense attorney's advice. He's keeping his statements about the case very general, and it's about rhetoric. It's not about, and it hasn't been thus far, he hasn't said anything about the specific allegations, the specific facts set forth in the indictment. So he is you know, walking that fine line and speaking about the case. Right, it does seem like he's avoiding the facts of the case. Now let's take a look at the, the charges against the former president again. How strong of a case has the Justice Department made in their 37 count indictment as far as the quality and, and quantity of evidence? Uh, it's it's strong on all counts. It's on, it sits on all fours here. Um, my review of the indictment and the specific allegations in the indictment say to me that this is a very, very rock solid case that DOJ has brought. They've put forth evidence, if proven, and facts if proven, that show Donald Trump intentionally and willingly uh, committed these crimes. Um, they show intent. They, there are different types of evidence here. It's not just one type of evidence is not just one witness. It looks to be multiple witnesses. It looks to be that they have a recording of Donald Trump himself talking about these classified documents. They have text messages. So this is really a potpourri. This is, frankly, prosecutor gold, the evidence that's set forth in this indictment. Uh, former Trump Attorney General Bill Barr said recently that it showed, quote, egregious obstruction and that if even half of it is true, then he is toast. Uh, would you say that that's a fair assessment? That's a very fair assessment. Uh, I actually feel for the defense team in this case. They are facing a lot of evidence and they're going to have to make a lot of moves to try to beat back this evidence. And I think really where they're going to have to fight is in the motion practice to try to get some of this evidence excluded. Because if it comes in, I really don't see how the, the DOJ can end up with anything other than a conviction. How much of this ultimately comes down to intent on, on the part of the former president? It's absolutely about intent here. Um, and what DOJ has set forth in the indictment are specific allegations and facts that show that Donald Trump knew what he was doing was wrong. So I think if they can prove those things, if they can show those facts that support intent and the criminal intent that they set forth in the indictment, I, I think they're going to win. Con nowadays, our thanks to you as always. Now I want to bring back in ABC's Catherine Falders in Washington for us. Catherine, as Trump faced these charges today, he's still working to build out his legal team. What's the latest on where things stand with that tonight? Yeah, we know that for weeks they have been informally laying the groundwork to bring more lawyers on board. This was before uh, those previous lawyers had departed. But we know today that two of those lawyers, Chris Kyes and Todd Blanche, who are representing him today in court, they also represent Trump in different legal matters in New York. They were there today. Uh, but the reality is that the Trump team has been interviewing people over the weekend. They continued to interview additional lawyers yesterday with the current legal team and the former president. They they still haven't found somebody uh, that they need to bring on to this team. But uh, defense attorneys that I've uh, been talking to here say that this is much bigger than just bringing one additional person on board. This is a big case, Lindsay. They need a lot of legal firepower here. And they have interviewed people who have turned down this case. They haven't been able to secure one additional attorney. Now, they're confident. They are talking to people. But this is a matter that is going to require a big team of people, lawyers with national security, uh, experience, lawyers with security clearance to uh, view classified documents, for example. So this is continuing. They're continuing to talk to additional people. They hope to have this nailed down in the coming days. And what about that key aide, Walt Nauta? Uh, we saw him right by Trump's side today. What comes next for him on the charges that he faces and, and making his own defense? 
Iyanata is this key aide who played a role in this alleged criminal scheme here. He faces six charges, including uh, that conspiracy charge, conspiracy to uh, obstruct. Now, in court, he was there today, Lindsay, with Trump. One of his lawyers who has represented him in this matter, Stanley Woodward, was also there with him. But he did not enter a plea today. This was a initial appearance. They asked for the arraignment to be delayed until he finds local counsel in Florida. So he is also looking uh, for an additional lawyer that arraignment has been delayed and he will show back up there in court uh, to be arraigned in the next two weeks Lindsay Catherine Falders for us reporting in from Washington headquarters there thank you now let's bring back in ABC News contributor and former FBI agent Asha Rangappa uh, now an assistant dean at Yale's Jackson School of Global Affairs is there anything that the former president said tonight uh, that you believe would make matters worse for him legally potentially well, shockingly, I did not hear anything tonight, but restraint is not one of President's, President Trump's fortes. Um, and I think as long as he continues to speak out, he carries the risk that he's going to provide self-incriminating evidence that can be used against him. There is a reason that we have a constitutional right to remain silent. Not everyone uses that right. Uh, Trump is one of those people. And we've seen, for example, in the CNN town hall that he participated in several weeks ago. He said that he had taken the documents, that they belonged to him. In an interview with Sean Hannity, he said similar things. And these just don't help him. Um, but unfortunately for him, he's because he is a candidate for office, he has to both play in the court of public opinion and also uh, balance that with the court of law. And I think in that tension, he typically favors the court of public opinion, maybe at the expense of uh, his own defense. And when we look at the types of classified documents at the center of these charges, how significant is it that so many of these documents are related to military matters and even about nuclear weapons? How does that impact the case? Well, it, create, it strengthens the case for the jury. But I also want to emphasize, just as someone who did counterintelligence investigations, beyond his criminal liability, I, I think it's important to not forget the actual risk that this poses to national security, because these were unsecured documents at a location that was frequented by 10, you know, 10,000 people, I think, in the indictment, it said, including foreign nationals. And there have been people who have been arrested at Mar-a-Lago, uh, who have been suspected as of being foreign agents in 2019, a Chinese businesswoman uh, just last year, uh, uh, Russian-speaking Ukrainian with two fake passports. I think we have to be really concerned about who may have gained access to these documents, whether or not this case actually proceeds all the way to the end uh, for criminal liability. Hey, let's talk about one specific piece of evidence, and that's the audio recording of the former president talking about some of those classified documents that he had in his possession, where he reportedly says, as president, I could have declassified it. Now I can't, you know, but this is still a secret. How significant is that comment? That comment is very significant because it shows that he knew that he possessed declass or, uh, classified information. In other words, this is not something that people packed up and was just lying around Mar-a-Lago. He had no idea. He knew that he possessed it. He was actually using it to uh, show off. And also he knew that they were classified. This really undercuts his defense that he's put out there several times, as his defenders have, that he somehow secretly and telepathically declassified these documents before he left. Clearly, he understood that there was a process that he had to go through before he left to do that. And, and at least in the case of the whatever document he's referring to in this audio tape, he did it. So this is really, once again, just like his public comments, it it really you know, pins him into a corner in terms of what he can argue in his defense with these very, very serious charges against him. And just give us a sense of, of what you can expect on, on timing and strategy on, on both sides as this case moves forward. I think this is going to be a very lengthy case. Uh, look, the fact that he's actually still looking for lawyers, and we can pause for a moment and just say how extraordinary it is that a former president of the United States has trouble finding lawyers. This is typically the kind of case that would make a lawyer's career, but we've seen that often his lawyers get implicated in the cases, uh, as they were in this case. One of his former lawyers, Evan Corcoran, 
eventually had to testify in front of the grand jury for uh, essentially helping to um, conceal some of the information. So I think that alone is going to delay it. And then we have all the procedural hurdles before we even start to see the semblance of a trial. Asha Rangappa, we thank you so much for your insight and your time tonight. Appreciate it. And now we head back to New Jersey with ABC's Jay O'Brien. Jay, uh, we got to say, uh, bears repeating, I mean, you had described this as the arraignment party. But this is also the eve of Donald Trump's 78th birthday. Uh, give us a sense of, of what the energy was like there tonight. Yeah, the energy was lively. This is a political event, Lindsay, and as you and I have been talking about, this is much different than the scene that we saw in that Miami courtroom today. Donald Trump, a federal criminal defendant, not looking special counsel, Jack Smith in the eye, and then, of course, getting back on his plane, coming here to New Jersey and delivering a defiant, delivering a fiery speech. One of the last things he told his supporters gathered here before wrapping up his remarks was they're not coming after me, they're coming after you, and saying that he was standing in the way. That is something he frequently says, but it takes on a new life as the former president faces these significant federal charges about mishandling classified documents, about potentially obstructing justice. And of course, there are no, there are not more than one person on that indictment. Well, it's Donald Trump and a co-conspirator, but there's not a group of people on that indictment. There are not Trump supporters on that indictment. It's Donald Trump and a co-conspirator on that indictment. Now, based on now in relation to those charges, Donald Trump saying that he was a president who was, quote, legally keeping his own documents. But of course, that is not what the special counsel has laid out in that lengthy indictment. They recount an audio recording that they have in which Trump allegedly admitted that he was possessing at least one document that was classified, that he couldn't declassify it. And the special counsel's argument is clear. By virtue of that document and the hundred plus other Others, the hundreds of others that were in at one point taken here to Trump Ben Metz, to Trump's Bedminster Club and also stored at Mar-a-Lago. Those documents being in fundamentally unsecure locations were are the crux of that indictment. What makes that action the special counsel says illegal, and that is what Trump is facing here, Lindsay. And I just have to point out, Jay, for a moment, just the striking contrast, the gravity and historic nature of the day. And over your shoulder, you have the crowd there gathered to listen to the president dancing to YMCA. It give us a sense of, of how that crowd responded as, as uh, the former president talked about how this was politically divisive and a heinous and evil act. Well, this was a crowd that cheered right along with him, Lindsay. This is a crowd of Trump supporters, obviously, a number of Trump donors. There was a pre-planned donor event for here at Trump's Bedminster Club for tonight. And then, of course, it dovetailed with this arraignment today. And then there are minor MAGA celebrities in the crowd as well, the likes of Mike Lindell, the likes of Cash Patel, et cetera, et cetera. But also, Lindsay, it's worth pointing out, this speech was full of Trumpian political rhetoric, uh, speaking ill of the special counsel, talking about how he had every legal right to have these documents, rhetoric in all. But that rhetoric, the rubber's going to meet the road, because in a courtroom, which is the other venue that Trump is facing, it's the facts that matter, and he's got to deal with the facts of what the special counsel has brought forward. Of course, we will be following this in the coming months and potentially years ahead. Jay O'Brien, our thanks to you. And joining us now for more is Republican presidential hopeful and former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson. Governor, thanks so much for your time tonight. God, it's good to be with you. Thank you. So you're a former federal prosecutor. Obviously, this is unprecedented case as we continue to describe it that way. Uh, you've now had the opportunity to read the indictment. Do you think that federal prosecutors have a strong case? I do. Uh, whenever you look at the specificity that's laid out in the indictment, it's a very strong case. Obviously, uh, this is going to have to be tried. You've got to prove all of that. But as Bill Barr said, if, if half of that is proved, uh, then it's a very devastating case that's being presented against the former president. I'm very pleased that there's been more Republican leaders step up and say, this is serious. We're not going to dismiss this lightly, particularly when you have service men and women that are held to a to the same standard and are held accountable if they violate that. And so this is a, a serious matter both uh, from the, for the criminal justice system, but also for uh, selecting the future leader of the country. And so I'm delighted that more 
leaders are showing courage and saying this is serious and we should not dismiss it lightly. Do you have any idea if this case would have the likelihood that it would be decided before the 2024 election or, or before the primary season? Well, I've actually uh, tried cases in which uh, classified information was involved, and it does add a level of complexity because you have to have the clearances, you have to have the protection as you exchange uh, the information as you get ready for trial. And so it is more complex than, than normal. But I hope that uh, the judges and the courts understand that you have to be fair to the defendant and give them uh, the right to prepare, but at the same time there's extraordinary public interest for our nation in getting this issue resolved in a timely fashion. The Speedy Trial Act applies not just to protect the defendant, but it also applies to give the public uh, protection and assurance that justice is not going to be delayed. And so uh, I think that it's going to continue through the campaign season. Uh, you're going to be looking at debates in August. You're going to be looking at primaries next year. And uh, former President Trump is likely to have court appearances during that time. It'll be interested to see whether the, the court's trying to accommodate his campaign schedule or whether they're going to insist upon compliance with the court schedule in a timely hearing of this case. Uh, what do you think about some of the, the fellow Republicans who are also running for president, uh, who are promising pardons uh, for, for President Trump, former President Trump? It, do you feel that that's appropriate? It is wrong. Uh, it is unjustified. It is a bad precedent. Uh, they're politically pandering uh, to get votes using the federal pardon power. So, no, it incenses me as somebody who's had to use the pardon power as governor and respects that power as president, and you don't use it as a campaign uh, wedge issue or a campaign tool. So I'm offended by that as someone who loves our justice system in America, and it's wrong uh, for candidates to be promising that, whether it's to a former president or whether it's to an average Joe that's out there. Uh, you just don't do that during a campaign. I want our candidates to show more courage and to speak out about this and provide leadership. Trump currently, as you well know, remains the front runner for the 2024 nomination on the Republican side. You've called out, uh, called on him to drop out of the race. Uh, that does not appear that that would be likely at all. But would you support him if he is nominated? Well, I'm not going to support somebody who's convicted of a felony, particularly one as involving the secrets of the United States. That's not reflective of who our commander chief should be and our national character and the high regard that we have for our military and those that collect these secrets. And so uh, we'll see how the debate develops uh, and how the case develops. Uh, and I'm not going to be supporting somebody who is convicted or who has uh, wrongfully uh, handled a material that jeopardizes the security of the United States. Governor, is that to say that you would support him if he is not convicted? Well, I don't expect him to be the nominee, and I want to be on the debate stage, so I expect that uh, we're going to be uh, negotiating this language to assure that uh, there's not going to be a circumstance that we're bound to support somebody who is convicted of a very serious felony that uh, violates the uh, a high office of president and the handling of classified material. That's very important for our country and no candidate should take that lightly. So let's see how that develops. Uh, but I want to be on that debate stage and I hope there's that opportunity. We've also got to have 40,000 donors. And so I hope everybody goes to asa2024.com, helps me to get on that debate stage. Just want to take one more swing at it, Governor. You would consider if he's not convicted supporting him? Uh, I want to look at what we have to do, what the language of that is. I haven't seen the language of the pledge yet, so that's still under negotiation, and I hope it's something that I can live with because I want to be on the debate stage, but there's certain principles you don't cross. Uh, there are at least 12 candidates currently in the race. Are you worried that this is 2016 all over again, too many candidates, and that your participation in the race would only allow Trump to, to become the nominee should you drop out? Well, uh, people understand who Donald Trump is. Uh, I think the fact that there's uh, 11 other candidates in the race reflect that 
Uh, there's a lot of leaders that want a different nominee than Donald Trump, and we want to beat Joe Biden, and he's not the right one to do it. So there's almost a unanimity uh, in that message. Uh, as far as the number, that's going to sort out uh, over time. That's what Iowa sorts out. That's what New Hampshire does. As I talked to the voters in New Hampshire most recently, uh, they're telling me this is serious. Uh, they believe that it is uh, political and a double standard here, but they also treat it as very serious and something that uh, they're not taking lightly and will be a factor as they make their decision uh, going into the uh, primary and caucus season. Presidential hopeful and Governor Asa Hutchinson, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. Good to be with you. And we still have much more to get to here on Prime tonight. Coming up, nearly two dozen troops injured overseas. We'll tell you where. The next, tired of feeling like, remember that old Tupac rap line, trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents? We update you on our nation's inflation. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. Reporting from Columbiana, Ohio, I'm Alex Perche. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. Donald Trump's